Welcome to Can I Get a Retake, where we explore the accomplishments of our innovative community. Each month, we speak with one of Great River Learning's higher ed instructors and authors. Together, we discuss trends in education, areas of study, and a variety of teaching styles and philosophies. My name is Michaela, your marketing coordinator. My name is Michelle, your web design supervisor. And this is Great River Learning's Can Can I I Get get a a retake? Retake? We are here today with Lee Murphy. Lee is a distinguished lecturer in the Department of Nutrition at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. She also works as an independent nutrition consultant, digital faculty consultant, and content expert for nutrition-related programs and materials. Lee has been a television nutritionist and health and nutrition editor and columnist. In addition, she teaches group exercise classes in Knoxville. Finally, and most importantly, but we're biased here, Lee is the author of Nutrition for Your Life, an online text and course material package published with Great River Learning. Welcome to the podcast, Lee. Thanks, everybody. (laughs) Have you ever been asked, can I get a retake? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Pretty much every day of my life, it seems like. (laughs) Well, so I guess we just wanted to ask first if you could tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. You know, how has your kind of journey evolved and to to teach this big course at UT? Great. Yeah. So I'll I'll try to make it as brief as possible. But um, I did my undergrad in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And then I came to UT and they have a dual master's in public health program. And then I got my registered dietitian degree through there as well, um, as well as my master's in public health and, and, and nutrition science. And then I worked, like I said, as a practitioner for about 10 years in public health nutrition. And then when I came to UT, after my third child was born, I, I, I was just looking for something different. And um, I the, the class that I called Nutrition 100, Introductory Nutrition, was just a standard large lecture course with discussion sections that teaching assistants, graduate teaching assistants assisted with. And so I taught that for a few years and then um, starting in maybe 2012 or so, I I started looking to go online. Um, So that was, uh, you know, over 10 years ago um, because the impetus was to expand the capacity of the course without costing more money. And at the time, this was, of course, way pre-COVID, but it was kind of a novel idea at the time because we, and we were successfully able to put the course online without any extra costs. And we extend, expanded the capacity at the time from about 200 to about 800, maybe at the time, or maybe 600 um, with, with no cost. At the time I was just recording my lectures, you know, my full extended lectures um, on kind of, you know, our, our LTI and um, <clears throat> put it up through the University of Tennessee. And that was very successful and wonderful. Um, however, through time, I just I, I was using other publications, and as a practitioner, I just felt like I was picking and choosing this and that, and, and I felt like some stuff was left out, and other things weren't emphasized enough as a practitioner. And so I wanted I'm very well aware. My, so my class, let me back up. It fulfills a gen ed. It's called Volcor at Tennessee Fulfillment. And so for natural sciences. So I have a lot, most of my students are not nutrition majors. Some of them require the class for kinesiology or it used to be nursing and of course nutrition, but most of them are communications, business, you know, other majors. Um, and so I'm very well aware they are taking my class just, you know, as a health class basically. And, and you know, a natural science course, but I am teach it in that manner because I want them to have basic health principles. And so, um, I, I, want, I wanted to teach it in that public health mindset that I have of just, I want you to have these healthy practices moving forward in your life. And whether you become a nutritionist or this is the only health related science class you take it the rest of your life, I want you to remember things and take them with you the rest of your life. So that's kind of my context of teaching. And I just decided that I, I wanted to have exactly what I wanted in the textbook and what I felt like that the students needed most. And through this, we have expanded even more. COVID was part of that process, but now I have about 1,500 students a semester and started, you know, 10 years ago with 200 with, again, 
really minimal, if zero dollars to certainly, you know, me, we, we have had a few more GTAs, which of course, I guess is stipend money, but it wasn't additional costs for the university in that manner. So that was a really great aspect. And best for me as a public health nutritionist, I'm teaching and reaching more students with health related principles. And, um, you know, that helps me to affect more lives and teach them these principles without costing more for the university. So that's been a good thing. You, you're reaching all of these students and giving them some basic, you know, health knowledge. If you had to boil down, you know, your health knowledge, like what are the main things that you want them to take away from taking your class? Just in terms of as a, as a nutritionist? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, I really push home just simple things like eating five fruits and vegetables a day, which is something I teach to kindergartners and, <laughs> you know, senior citizens and everybody in between. So um, simple principles like that, which we all forget, hydration, <laughs> um, you know, teaching them what um, your blood cholesterol numbers should be and what standard blood glucose numbers. So when they go to the doctor and they tell, they hear their, their numbers, they'll know what's normal. If they, what they regularly consume, we can, we'll talk about diet tracker, but it's so not that they need to be their own nutritionist, but, you know, maybe I might need to talk to my practitioner about considering a calcium supplement or a vitamin D supplement, or what are probiotics or these basic things that are in the media, especially with social media these days and dispelling some myths. I have sometimes students come in with like TikToks and it's like, is this true? Is this true? Is this true? Oh, <laughs> so <wow>. that's <laughs> fun. I can be like, yes, no, no, no. So um, that, you know, I, I, I try to integrate that into our publication as well as, you know, the, the things that I discuss um, every day in my class. So I, just to note, I still teach face-to-face -face and online. And I, I, I want to back up real fast and say when yeah. we went online, we being University of Tennessee back in 2012, 2013, we were super rigorous. My department head and I were, we had like two semesters of a hybrid to make sure that the rigor was the same. They took the same exam between the face-to-face -face and online. So a lot of, I think, professors and instructors are worried about the rigor dropping in online, um, especially with asynchronous online. And I'm a big advocate. It doesn't work for all classes. I that's that's a fact. However, it um it it, it is more successful than face to face sometimes in other classes. And so it's important to recognize that. But we were super um particular in making it um online and making sure that rigor was sustained for both asynchronous online and and face to face. So sure. Would you say that students are engaging with your materials differently than they did when you first started putting materials online? Um, you know, I, I do think so. I think I think writing my own publication with Great River Learning allowed me to to again put out there what I feel is most important. And I feel like other instructors who might you know nutrition classes, I think all nutrition classes should focus on certain things, and that's a lot what I put out there. Um, however. I think it's important to to recognize that as time has gone on, it's been very nice, even for my face to face students that I have recorded presentations. And if it, even if an instructor is doing their own face to face learning and has either my lectures or just lectures in general to 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 fall back on, it's so helpful because a if they miss a class, it's not a big deal because they can rewatch it. B they can rewatch again if they, if they missed something and weren't paying attention or whatever. I and I, I never stress out about having if something if it snows and I have to cancel a class or or something happens with the face to face. They have access to the online lectures as well, and then the the online students can watch it as many times as they want. Or you know what? They don't have to. I don't require that they have to go through the online lectures if they enjoy learning by reading and don't get as much from me talking, that's okay to me. As long as they're learning the material, that's what I want. And of course, I think it helps to do all the things that are there, but I want them to learn the material, what's best for them. And this outlet allows that. Um, so that's really been really helpful yeah. to see and, and have that um, in the picture. Do you feel like you were phased at all by COVID then? Or did you already have all of these systems in place before? 
I, I, can't, I can't say I was unfazed, but I, I was as minimally phased as is possible. And of course, we never would wish this again on anybody what happened. But when it happened, I just very easily moved my face to face at the time to finish the semester online, of which was already recorded and perfectly planned. Yeah. And then, and at that point, it was just from spring break to the end of the semester, which wasn't, you know, back in March 2020, which wasn't a big deal. And then for the next year, everybody was online. I didn't have any face to face, but that's what most of my students. So just as a note about, I still probably have about 200, 250 that are face to face and the other 1000 wow. plus are all asynchronous online. And very, I didn't mention this and I don't, some people might, might connect with this, but very ironically, <laughs> the impetus I told you was to expand the capacity, right? Mm -hmm. Without having more, you know, dollars and manpower and otherwise. But very ironically, the demand for my course went up when I went online, because again, this was back 10 years ago, but people wanted online and, and this was a novel thing at the time and they wanted that flexibility. And so mm -hmm. my online classes fill up way faster than my face-to-face, -face, even though I have five times as many online sections as I do face-to-face um, -face sections because people want that flexibility and, and know it's a successful class and have heard from their classmates and peers that it's an enjoyable and, you know, hopefully fun class to take. And so that has, the online component has really been a huge asset to me. And like I said, it not that COVID wasn't a thing oh. <laughs> or a blip, it was, <laughs> but I was minimally affected in my and my students learning was minimally affected as well I think great River learning that's such a good job that's one reason that attracted me to write the publication was because of the marketing of the fact that it it, it totally is catering to the current students way of learning and how they want to learn and how they they thrive in learning and I think that if if we um, cater to that and then we can present our material and, and help them integrate it a lot better. Yeah. Well, and we could go back to that. We're going to get in our time machine and go back to 2018 and we could talk about, you know, what prompted you to work with Great River Learning in the first place and kind of develop this entire thing. Well, you know, I think, um, again, I had worked with several publications previously that I, it, I just felt like some material was emphasized that wasn't as important and others was that needed to be and vice versa. And just as a practitioner, I had my things that I felt like my population of students needed to focus more or less on. Again, my population is a cross section of health majors and non-health majors. So it wasn't, it's not just a classroom of people that are going to be nutritionists, mainly not, to be honest with you. And so I needed the material that touched all aspects of life, <clears throat> excuse me. And so Nutrition for Your Life, the name of the publication is meant to touch people that are both going to be dietitians in the future, going to be healthcare practitioners, potentially nurses or physical therapists or doctors or whatever, or own a business or work at a business or, you know, be an engineer. So I, I wanted it to touch everybody. And so I, I felt like I could do that by help writing my own publication and um that was the impetus I guess of doing that was to to do what I felt like the students needed to hear most yeah and you've talked about the resources that that you've created but also the tools too diet tracker mm -hmm. specifically which allows students to have a way to kind of capture these goals and follow them yes talk about that a little bit the development process um, yes. <laughs> and how it helps students effectively reach their health goals. Absolutely. Okay. So diet tracker is basically a, a nutrition analysis app. And um, I could talk about this all day long, um, but I'll first by saying most introductory nutrition classes have some sort of diet log or, or experience because in my opinion, it is first of all, something that they do by themselves. It's It's hard to I don't want to say cheat, but it's something that you need to do by yourself. It's not like you can share answers with someone. It's the best part though. It's, it's self um, analysis. So 
first of all, they are learning about more about themselves and their own needs. And nutritionally, obviously, I'm selfishly thinking about their own nutritional needs and how they can maybe look to improve their nutritional goals and where they are. But it's also something that's individual to them and, and which is helpful from an instructional standpoint that they are doing their own work and this is helpful for them. Um, but as I had worked through many, and I actually helped develop many other dietary analysis programs in the past, one of the main problems was well, way back in the day, none of them were auto graded. And so you'd have this dietary analysis that's out there and there's plenty that are out there for the public also, but it's just data. It doesn't, you can't do anything with it except you have to ask questions. But when you have 1500 students, it takes a lot of time. It's basically like, there's no rubric for answers because everyone's answer is different because their intake is different, right? And for those who don't know, you would generally have like a three to five day food log that they would keep to themselves how much they drink and eat of different foods. And then they input it into the system. And then it gives a, a readout of their recommendations, of the, what they consume compared to recommendations, like how, what with their carbohydrates and fats and proteins, as well as their micronutrients like vitamin D and, um, and then, you know, their, their dietary fiber and all the different types of <clears throat> aspects that can be analyzed. So back to what I was saying <clears throat> in the past, it was very difficult because there was no auto grade. So that was one of my main impetus of, of doing this was to have something that was auto graded. <clears throat> Over time, these have other, uh, there are other out there that do have some auto graded questions as well. However, they're not as integrated seamlessly as we are because sometimes there, uh, maybe you get a readout and then you have to put the answers into a table and then that is what you answer questions on. So the student still has to transfer their data. And you can imagine with over a thousand students, there's a lot of inaccuracies and, in, in, you know, just data entry errors that then mess up the whole grading assignment. And then you got to track that down. It's just a nightmare that that can be. So when we created this, the Great River Learning, we kind of cut that middleman out of the way. So so what their um, analysis shows goes directly into their question database. And then their multiple choice questions are directly filled with the data from their own analysis, which is just genius because there's there's no reason they have they should transfer the data. That's you know, that's just data entry. There's mm -hmm. that's it's nice to have that middleman cut out. So our dietary analysis auto graded questions are directly related to their particular individualized dietary analysis, which is just huge from my perspective, because that, that that's not really a common practice. So then, however, that said, we also have sections that are manually graded that have some short answers because you have to have those as well. Some things are not really possible to auto grade in that regard. And that's okay because you want that as well, um, but it cuts that grading more than in half in terms of the things that you know, you know, just calculations that a, a computer can do for you. <laughs> you don't have to do that in in this in through Diet Tracker, which is just a great lifesaver for instructors. When the student puts their data in, what does that look like? You know, what did I eat for breakfast? I had avocado yeah. toast for breakfast. Okay, good. So if I'm gonna put that into diet tracker, what does that look like? So you just there's a there's um a diet tracker page, it's kind of separate from my particular mm -hmm. um publication. And you go in and you put a little data on your biometrics, like your height and weight and gender and that sort of thing. And then you would go in and um, put in your your what meal it was, breakfast, lunch, or dinner, and then you kind of search for toast, and then you'd find the toast that you had, and you click that, and then you'd search for avocado, and then, or you might there might be avocado toast on there, that might be a meal, <laughs> but it, if it doesn't have a particular actual item you had from say McDonald's or something that would be easily on there, then you can build it. Um, with the okay. components that you had if you made it at your own yeah. place. And then other thing about great about diet tracker, you can save like favorite meals. So if you have diet tracker every morning, you just put a little star and you can pull that back up without a problem. You don't have to re-input it. You can also change right. serving sizes. Um, and another thing I wanted to say that diet tracker has that most other programs I'm aware of do not have is water entry. <laughs> and so most of them do not have a separate input for the amount of water you consume and so or cups of water and I know we don't have a lot of um 
specific analysis about that, but just to be able to input that data is super important for them to acknowledge if they are drinking water or not, but also comment on that in their self-analysis, like I drank no water today, or <laughs> I had plenty and not that we're going to grade them on that. And I'm certainly make sure to tell them we're not in with all of these reports, we're not grading your healthiness by any means, or no one's judging you if you had <laughs> this or that. Um, but we're just trying to see where you fall with the recommendations. And if you're meeting those again, especially with micronutrients, but also with the other macronutrients and what are your goals for if it's, if you're in the sports and sports nutrition, or if you are, um, you know, ha- trying to gain weight for a bodybuilding competition, or if you, you know, whatever it is, you um, can do that through diet tracker. So that's exciting. Right now we have an A and a B and the A section of each kind of analysis is the auto graded questions. And the B section is the, is the essay or short answer. The auto graded question, like I said earlier, might be your vitamin intake was blank. Did you meet recommendations? Yes or no? That's the auto graded question. And then the um, free response question might be, name some foods that are high in, high in vitamin A. And so that, and particularly that you ate or that, and if you didn't eat any vitamin A, then just some foods in general. So I guess in theory that could be auto graded, but you can imagine it would be, there, it would be difficult to capture every single vitamin A yeah. food that's out there. So we make that a free response, but it's easily graded because you see carrots or, you know, sweet potatoes or something that it, it, when you're familiar, what foods contain vitamin A, it's very easily graded, but it allows them to apply it. Like what foods do I eat that's high in vitamin A? Did I eat any? (laughs) Was it, you know, was it a drink or was it the foods or was it none at all? And so we do that type of exercise for all of those micronutrients, excuse me. Um, And and back to an example for, this might be getting too much minutia, but back to the macronutrients of, of carbohydrates and fats and proteins, I have them, we have them count how many fruits and vegetables they are consuming in their three days. Back to my big soapbox about (laughs) fruits and vegetables and the importance of those in our diet. And so uh, we found that a lot of other programs that are out there, it's very difficult for auto grading to capture all that, all your, all your food groups. And I've tried this many different times with many different publications and like, if you say like vegetables on a pizza, like I don't know how many vegetables, like is that a sliver of an onion or is that an entire tomato, right? It depends mm-hmm. on what kind of pizza you had. And so that is important to have that individualization as well. So someone can kind of count and have the practice of counting how many fruits did I have today? And so anyway, that's another example of something that we might have them do that's great application to their lives. So we'd love to bring you back on probably, you know, in a year or two years. Absolutely. Either. I would love to do that. I think that, that, so, you know, um, I, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, there's so many things in nutrition that we could talk about, to be honest mm-hmm. with you, <laughs> that I, we yes. could, you know, they're obviously a nutrition podcast that do <laughs> multiple times a week and, and go forever. So, but we could talk about that, but, or if you want to do one specifically about diet tracker in general, I just can't, I feel like I can't emphasize enough to people that are looking for a dietary analysis program it pales in comparison because it's it's when the student has to do the the data entry it it so much is lost in translation because you know they they're doing that and i remember this is probably too much information but when tim was helping me you know with the very initial steps he was because we were trying to figure all this out he was like why why do you why don't you just put the data in the question, like, why do you have to do like third grade standardized testing? Like, look at this table and fill in this, right? <laughs> like he didn't call it that, but that's what I'm kind of thinking. Like, you know, like, how do you read a table? Like, that's not what this class is measuring. Mm-hmm. This class is measuring your self-analysis of your dietary intake. And so if that's part of the question, that just reiterates what you're trying to, you know, analyze, but also takes out that middle step that's not necessary. So I, I, that is not available in other products. And so if someone is looking for it and they see that it's true auto grading, there's no manipulation of, of numbers. That's, I think, something that we have that others don't that is really sets us apart, I think is great. So anyway, that's no, my that's- 
no, that was good. That was a good summary too mm -hmm. that we can have. <laughs> But as we're coming up to the, the end of our time, we do like to ask um, a, a segment called You're Wrong, You Are Wrong. Um, it's an opportunity for you to address any big misconception or lie or myth in nutrition within a minute or two. That is good. Um, there are just so many. I can't, I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I guess gluten's on my mind in particular because we just had that conversation that um, so many people think gluten needs to be avoided by everybody. And that is not the case as Michaela very much knows. If you need to, you need to. If you have an allergy or an intolerance, 100%, you should avoid it. But if you do not, you do not need to avoid those foods. Similar, that goes with a lot of things like... Um, like, like we said, like dairy or other, other types of foods that are soy that are out there that have misinformation around them. And people think that have gotten either because of mistranslation of research or because of social media, putting things out there that's untrue, that is very frustrating that, um, think that because this worked for me, it works for everybody. If I had a pill that everybody could take that would make us all look like we want to, I would share it with you and we'd be trillionaires and that would be great. <laughs> but there is no such thing. It takes hard work and effort and um, planning <laughs> and mental space to make the healthy practices happen. And so it's just it, 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 it recognizing that is super important in the big picture and acknowledging that there is no one solution. Even like intermittent fasting is a big thing that a lot of people are doing now. It works for some people and that's great. But for most people, it, it's not the solution for a lifetime of change. For, again, some people it works great and that's wonderful. But I've been interviewed for different news stories about, you know, trending diets and things like that. The way most people do it that are misinformed is not going to be successful for you long-term in your life if you're doing it in certain ways. Um, and anyway, that's just one example of something that's kind of hot in media lately that, that people think it's a quick fix to this or that, and that's not necessarily the case. And I'm not dissing it completely, but I am saying in, in many instances, it is not the solution, especially active people. Um, if you have any conditions like diabetes or other related sometimes it can mess with hormones for females if you're fasting too much so anyway there's a lot out there that um in the nutrition world is misinformation a lot of you yeah. are wrong <laughs> <laughs> we could have we that. could have a whole podcast series called you are wrong in nutrition to be honest with you <laughs> I, was I, next soy. I know there's some men who won't eat so right. drink so that is that is yeah. completely false that that it will cause men to have breasts or you mm -hmm. know um have female tendencies no that is research has been discounted so many times but some men still and, and that's just stereotypically but won't put won't use soy powder in their mm -hmm. you know um in their shakes yes. you know for protein yes whey has a lot of huge sports nutrition benefits and is a complete protein and has, and, and not the soy is not complete also, but whey has a lot of research benefits with the components of the amino acids. I won't get into the specifics, but <laughs> there's a lot of research behind that. But um, if you are vegetarian or vegan, soy is a much better alternative than pea protein. Pea protein is not complete. It doesn't have all these amino acids. But anyway, that was a little too much weed <laughs> there. No, that's okay. But, any other questions, Michelle, that you want to get to? Um, well, like we said, we could have a whole podcast series of all my nutrition questions, but <laughs> I don't have any more for today. <laughs> okay. Well, good. We'll have to invite you back, you know. I would love that. And better, you guys, then... please, yes. And both yeah. of you, too, if you have any personal nutrition questions, feel free to email me. I might. <laughs> well, thank you, Lee, for joining us on Can I Get a Retake? We really, I think, Michelle and I enjoyed chatting with you and the energy that you brought to this conversation. Lee Murphy is the author of Nutrition for Your Life, a digital interactive textbook for introductory nutrition courses. In conjunction with Great River Learning, Lee also developed Diet Tracker, a nutrition tracking app that integrates with her publication. Can I Get a Retake is hosted by Michelle Manneman and Michaela Albee. The show is edited by Maggie Christensen. 
Artwork for the podcast was designed by Michelle Manneman. Our intro and outro music was created by Coma Media. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please subscribe, share, rate, and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts. To join the conversation, you can find us on Instagram at Can I Get a Retake. For show notes and episode transcripts, visit greatriverlearning.com slash podcast.